Hello. So today we're going to tackle a very important concept, and that is the principle of minimum potential energy, a hugely important concept in structural mechanics. But first, I assume that if you're viewing this course, you have a little bit of background, at least in elasticity, that you've taken either a solid mechanics course or some sort of a strength of materials or, or elastic materials course. And so I'm just going to give a quick review of some of the concepts you would have come across in that material. Also, for those of you who have been requesting copies of my notes, there's a link in the description down below, which you can use to download copies. The first and the most important is the equation sigma ij comma j plus f sub i equals zero. And this on a solid mechanics level is the fundamental equation that is used. This is Newton's second law for a body in equilibrium, which is why the right hand side is equal to zero, because there's no acceleration. So this is for an elastic body in equilibrium and is really the sum of the forces equals zero. That's what that equation is. Again, if you haven't had this material before, you're just going to have to accept my word for it for now. But equally importantly is this idea of index notation that we're using here, these I's and J's. And for those of you who haven't seen it, it's probably a little bit different than what you're thinking. Uh, for example, when an index is repeated, such as the J here, it means that we're going to sum over that index. So just to be a little bit clearer what we're talking about, if I were to expand out this equation, it actually gives us three equations in three dimensions. This comma j means the derivative with respect to x sub j. So partial sigma 1, 1, partial x1, plus partial sigma 1, 2, partial x2, plus partial sigma 1, 3, partial x3, plus f1 is equal to zero. And this would be the equation in the x1 direction. And similarly, there are equations in the other directions too. We can expand it like this for now. In addition, you would have encountered this formula, that the traction on a surface, T sub i, is equal to the stress sigma ij times n sub j. Sigma ij is the stress, and n sub j is the normal vector on the surface at that location. This is known as Cauchy's formula. And if I just draw it, here is a surface, you've got a normal vector here, and what this formula gives you is what is the surface traction at this point. Attraction is just a fancy word for a force. In fact, a pulling force. Attraction is a pulling force. One more formula I want to review is epsilon sub ij, which are the strains, is equal to one half u sub i comma j plus u sub j comma i, where u is the displacement. So this equation is a strain displacement relation. I can very simply take the variation of the strain, just like you might expect, as one half del u sub i comma j plus del u sub j comma i. For the purposes of our problems, this can be simplified to del u sub i comma j, and that's due to symmetry on the material level. Let's give these some numbers, one, two, three, and four. And this brings us now to a very important topic, and that is the principle of virtual work. You might recall from particle mechanics that virtual work is defined as the work done by external forces acting on a virtual displacement. One of the important concepts to remember is that during this virtual displacement, the force remains fixed. It should be clear for anyone who watched my previous video on the delta operator, a link to that is above in case you need to refresh yourself, that the delta or the variational operator can conveniently be used to denote a virtual displacement. So the idea behind the principle of virtual work is that if we have a deformable body that has been restrained in this case, it's in equilibrium, and it has some generalized surface forces, Q, Q1, Q2, Q3, otherwise called tractions. In addition, it might have some body forces, which are forces per unit volume, F1, F2, and F3, and maybe we want to add some generalized moments. Now, if we consider a point within this body, P, there'll be some sort of an associated stress field and displacement and strain field related to that. And I remind you that the delta UIs, the virtual displacements, must be kinematically admissible. That is to say, they must adhere to the geometric boundary conditions, where the variation of the displacement field is zero at the geometric boundary conditions. Now the external virtual work we'll call delta W sub E can be written as the integral over the surface of the work performed by the surface forces or tractions. And this we'll call T sub I times del U sub I, just force times displacement, DS. 
In addition, we need to add the contribution of the body forces, and those are simply F sub i, the force per unit volume, times del u sub i dv. Call this number 5. And now if we examine this first term on the right-hand side, we can do a little bit of manipulation with it. So the integral over s of t sub i del u sub i ds is equal to, and then from Cauchy's formula on the previous page, t sub i is equal to sigma i j n j. This is equal to the integral over s of sigma i j n j del u i ds. Then we'll make use of Gauss's divergence theorem. And what Gauss's divergence theorem tells us is that a volume integral of the gradient of a vector a, dv, is equal to a surface integral of that vector a, that same vector a dotted with the normal taken over the surface. So what does that mean mathematically? If we look at this term here, that is sigma ij del u sub i times n, and so we can rewrite that as a gradient over the volume. So that would become the integral over the volume of sigma ij del ui, comma j. I remind you, for those familiar with index notation, that to take the gradient is just comma j. You're taking the derivative with respect to each direction, and because the j is now repeated, it means we sum over 1, 2, 3, etc. For those of you who haven't seen index notation, you're just going to have to take my word for this for now. And we're missing a dv. All right, so I can expand this out. Therefore, we can rewrite the surface integral of ti del ui ds as the volume integral, and now I'm just going to expand this using the product rule. So it's sigma ij comma j del ui plus sigma ij del ui comma j dv. We'll call this number six. And now we can substitute equation six into five. We can take this and put it back into our original equation. So six into five, and that gives us that the external work is equal to the integral over the volume of sigma ij comma j plus fi del u sub i, where I've grouped this and this fi, because they both multiply del u sub i. The reason it's equal to zero is from equation one on the previous page. This was our original equation, which was for an elastic body in equilibrium, plus this term over here sigma ij del u i comma j dv. And that is equal to, if you go back to the previous page here and you look at equation 4, del u i comma j is just equal to the strain. So this is the integral of the volume of sigma ij del epsilon ij dv. And lo and behold, this is the principle of virtual work. We'll number it number 7 and continue this thought on the next page. So summarizing equation 7, we can write that the external virtual work is equal to the volume integral of sigma ij delta epsilon ij dv. We'll number this number 8. We'll put a box around it. The principle of virtual work could be stated as follows, that the external virtual work by the external loads is equal to the internal virtual work by the internal stresses. This is the principle of virtual work for a deformable body, and you might have noticed we haven't used any constitutive relations in getting here. That is to say that the principle of virtual work is valid for any deformable body, regardless of the material it's made from. And this brings us to the principle of minimum potential energy. And really what we'd like to do is take the principle of virtual work and put it into a form that we can use for our own purposes, which is one that requires it in the context of a constitutive relation so that it's valid for elastic materials. For now, we'll continue to limit things to small displacements, but it's valid for any elastic materials, both linear or nonlinear. So we proceed by defining the potential of the external work, and we call this V. And I know in previous videos we've used V and Lagrange's equations to denote the potential energy, here it's very specifically the potential due to the external work, and in fact it's the negative of the external work. So rather than viewing the work of the external loads as external work, we're going to view it in respect of it increasing the potential energy of the system. And so the increase in potential energy of the system, V, is equal to the negative of the external work. Taking the variation of V gives us del V is equal to the negative virtual external work. And then we'll define the strain energy density per unit volume. We'll call this U sub zero. And that is equal to the integral from zero to epsilon ij 
of sigma ij d epsilon ij. It's equal to the stress times the strain at any point for all the different strains in the body. From this we can infer that the partial derivative of u sub zero with respect to epsilon ij is equal to sigma ij. The derivative of the strain energy density with respect to the strains yields the stress. Let's give these some numbers, number 9 and number 10. So now substituting, I guess, equation 10 and 9 into equation 8, I can get to a very useful form of this, which is negative delta V, the external work is just negative of the internal potential, is equal to the integral over the volume, now making the substitution, partial u naught divided by partial epsilon ij times delta epsilon ij dv. That is equal to, I recognize that this is just the expanded form of the variation of u naught. So if I take the variation of u naught and expand it, that gives me partial u sub naught partial eij times delta eij. So this is the volume integral of delta u naught dv. Now because of the commutative property of the delta operator, I can take that outside the integral. That is equal to delta, the variation of the integral over the volume, of u naught dv, but the integral of u naught dv is just u, it's the strain energy u. So I can rewrite that as delta u. So what I've shown through this is minus delta v is equal to delta u. We'll call that equation 11. And then by bringing it to the same side, I can write this as delta u plus delta v is equal to zero. And then again, using the commutative property of the delta operator, that's just delta of u plus v is equal to zero. And then I can rewrite this compactly as delta pi is equal to zero, where pi is equal to u plus v. It's the total potential energy. And it can also be written as equal to u minus we, the external work. This here, this delta pi equals zero, such a seemingly simple equation, is the principle of minimum potential energy. And it is extremely powerful, not just in its own right, but because it also helps us to get to Hamilton's principle, which is the holy grail of where we're heading. Let's put a big red box around this, and we'll put a yellow box around this intermediate result. So the important thing here is that the potential energy now is written as U plus V. I know in previous videos we've just called it V. Now we call the potential energy pi, and it has two components. One is the potential due to the external work, V, which is the negative of the external work. The other is the strain energy U which is due to the stored stresses and strains within the material. The principle of minimum potential energy tells us that a structure in equilibrium will assume a displacement field that minimizes its total potential energy. Let's add to the board that pi is equal to u plus v, sometimes called v sub e, just to denote the potential due to the external work. And this is equal to the total potential energy of the structure, Again, V is equal to the negative of the external work, and we call this the potential of the external loads. Let's give these some numbers, 12, 13, and 14. For those of you who have been asking me to show how we incorporate the external loads into Lagrange's equations, this is the method that is employed. It's actually using the principle of virtual work that we're able to incorporate these loads as part of the potential energy of the system. I'm going to save that derivation for a different video. I, I don't want to get too into depth now with it, but I thought I would point it out because a bunch of you have been asking about this. I realize there's a lot of math again in this video. I want to make sure we're clear about what we did here, even for those of you who are not so clear about index notation. So let's take it from the top really quickly. I started off with a basic review of concepts of elasticity. Most importantly was this, the equilibrium equation which suggests that for a static body, the stresses and body forces are in equilibrium. We also mentioned Cauchy's formula, which gives us the traction on a surface based on the stresses in the body. And then we went ahead and derived the principle of virtual work, where we defined the external work based on body forces and surface tractions. We were able to use the Gauss divergence theorem to convert these surface tractions into a volume integral. When we then made substitutions and grouped appropriate terms, we found that these terms could be cancelled out based on the equilibrium equations in the previous slide. And all that remained was this term. 
This term could be shown to be the internal strain energy, and from the principle of virtual work we found out that the external virtual work done by the external loads is exactly equal to the internal virtual work by the internal stresses. And this was for any deformable body. It made no use of any constitutive relation. So it was valid for any deformable body, whether or not it was elastic. We then went ahead and expanded this to the principle of minimum potential energy, where we defined a potential V, which was the negative of the external loads. And then we defined a strain energy density, U sub zero, to handle the internal virtual work. And we were able to show that pi, which is the total potential energy, that being the sum of the strain energy plus the potential of the external loads, pi is stationary, meaning the variation of pi is zero, and pi, the total energy, follows an extremal. This is a necessary, although not sufficient, condition for it to be a minimum. You can take it from me that this extremal happens to be a minimization. And what this is saying is that the shape of the structure will deform in such a way as to minimize the sum of its internal work minus the external work being done on it. That is the principle of minimum potential energy, and it's a really powerful and beautiful principle. It's really telling you that nature behaves in such a way as to minimize the potential energy of every object and structure and really any deformable body in it. Any time a load is exerted on an elastic body, it will deform in such a way as to minimize its total potential energy. I think that's pretty cool. You know, one thing I've got to fix as I'm looking at it now is I've left this as V sub E. A lot of texts will have that as V sub E, but for the consistency of my notes, I'm just going to call it V as I have above. Well, with that, we've reached the end of this video. I hope you found something exciting and interesting in it. If you have, please go ahead and hit those like buttons so others can get to see it too. If you have any questions, comments, criticisms, or found this just plain ordinary, I'd love to hear from you in the comments section below. If you'd like to be notified of any new video releases, please hit those subscribe buttons and click the bell next to it. And please note for any of you who are interested in getting hold of a copy of these notes, there's a link down below in the description that you can use to download them. With that, I thank you for watching, and I will catch up with you in the next video.